Chapter 10 of A Water Biography by Robert C. Leslie. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 10 Determined to sail farther east. Leave Dartmouth for Weymouth. Thick fog outside Mewstown. Shape a course for Portland Bill. The nautical instruments of RVW. We make Portland. Anchor inside breakwater near Chesil Beach. Night alarm by Thames Barge. I am boarded by officials owing to our unofficial flag. No papers, not registered, etc. Conclude, after a survey, that Weymouth is not a place to remain in and sail for the Solent. St. Albans Race. Arrive in Solent. Meet Royal Mail Steamer Parana. Her swell and result. Anchor at Southampton. Run up the Itchen. Moor ship off Itchen Ferry. Take a cottage at Woolstone. Pay off Tupman. Description of Itchen Ferry, etc. My wife drags her anchor. Advertise the yacht for sale. Advise to sell her by auction and move her into Southampton docks. Our neighbors in dock. The fox, etc. We are mistaken for a Dutch family and become lions in the dock. Baron talks Dutch. A night alarm in the dock. The dog overboard. Difficulty of getting fresh water. Baron gets some on trial, etc. The day of sale. Yacht agents, marine store dealers, etc. on board. Eloquence and brandy. Sale collapses. I become wiser and poorer. An ignominious termination to our cruise. How it might or ought to have ended. Expensive adjectives. Leave the yacht. Baron ashore. He roasts a leg of mutton, etc. After drifting thus with my family for more than two months up and down the habitable parts of the southwest coast of England, and finding no resting place to our mind on terra firma, I now decided, as autumn was coming, to sail eastward, and weighed anchor on a fine clear morning about six for Weymouth or Portland Roads. We had, however, scarcely got as far as Dartmouth Mewstone before running into a fog as thick as that in which we passed the start two days before. Indeed, we had barely time to shape a course for the Bill of Portland before our last landmark, the Mewstone, vanished like a ghost in the mist. The nautical instruments on board the RVW were limited to a hand lead, a pair of dividers, a parallel ruler, an aneroid, and an old boat compass, purchased before leaving Sidmouth at a low price from a fisherman, or rather retired smuggler, he, as he said, having no further use for it. It was a large compass in an oak box, and having a heavy needle and card, and being slow and sedate in action, was very suitable for a small lively craft like ours in a seaway. 
It had, I knew, guided its original owner's lugger across channel on more than one dark night, and proved true to us in this short trip across West Bay in a fog. For when, luckily, about three in the afternoon, the fog cleared a little, we made the bill about a mile off on the port bow, and with a fair wind rounded it close inshore, and brought up inside the breakwater near the Chesil Beach, our light draft allowing us to lie here in about two fathoms, where, as Tupman told Mrs. L., she might sleep in comfort, there not being water enough inside us for any other vessel. I regret to say, however, that any small faith my wife may have had in Tupman was entirely lost. When about twelve that night she was roused suddenly by a great rush of water and banging of heavy sails, as a large dark-winged Thames barge ran close past, and shooting up in the wind let go her anchor just ahead of us. I looked out and saw that, as usual, our riding light had gone out. The day after our arrival at Portland was Sunday, and for want of something else to do, Tupman hoisted what he called our house flag in honor of the day. Now this flag was simply two pieces of white and blue bunting stitched together by the Commodore, as a private signal between the yacht and her crew when the boat was away. Its effect, however, upon the mind of the local Coast Guard officer was such that it had not been at our masthead ten minutes before he came off with a boat's crew and after rowing round us inquired our name, which was not painted on our stern, and when told it said, Rip Van, what do you say? and appeared to think we were joking. He was a Scotchman, and I invited him on board, and for the first time since leaving Exmouth was asked for the vessel's papers, which I had almost forgotten, and told him that if any existed, they were still waiting for me at Exmouth. Then he wanted to know where and by whom the Pennywinkle was built, and where we were bound, and finally, after a long discussion, said, He supposed he must report her as an unfinished vessel in the hands of her builder and owner bound for Southampton. It was that flag of strange device which had evidently bothered him, because, as he remarked, he could not find that it belonged to any known yacht club or yacht. Portland Breakwater forms a fine harbor of refuge, and a safe anchorage for men of war in larger craft, but to us it wanted the quiet repose of the small landlocked harbors of Devon and Cornwall, while the tidal harbor of Weymouth did not look tempting as a permanent resting place for a small yacht. I therefore took the first fair wind early one day for the Solent, and we rolled merrily before it until off St. Albans, where we found the ebb still so strong against us that even with a nice breeze we barely held our own, and tumbled about for over two hours in the short cross sea or race off that headland, so that it was past three in the afternoon before we ran over the bridge between the Needles and Shambles Shoal into the Solent. We had, however, a long flood tide now with us through the Solent, and ran fast past Hurst Castle and the lovely shores of the island. 
Just before passing Hurst, we met the old Royal Mail steamer Parana. The weather here was of course quite smooth, but she came close by us, and the swell from her enormous paddles was so heavy and steep that it caused the RVW to pitch her largest anchor off the rail overboard, leaving it for a moment swinging in such a way that it threatened to knock a hole through our bow. Tupman and Baron with difficulty contriving to secure it again before it did so. I was rather surprised at this anchor going overboard because shortly before we spent a long time tumbling about in the race off St. Albans without a sign of its moving. Luckily our precious dinghy was on deck for had she been towing astern she must have been smashed against our counter or the outrigger aft. I have sailed since for years in the Solent and Southampton water among the largest steamers, but never met so short and steep a swell as that kicked up by this old paddle-wheeler. Tupman was well acquainted with Southampton water, and we ran past Calshot and anchored off the town quay about six o'clock and remained there till next day when we shifted our berth and moored the RVW in a choir to one among the pretty fishing boats off Itchen Ferry. There was no railway or smoky iron ship building yard then on that side the river, and on the high ground at Woolston, above the mouth of the Itchen, were many tempting detached houses surrounded by gardens overlooking the water, with a foreground of lovely gorse-covered common, tempted by which and a low rent we soon decided on taking one. Before leaving Sidmouth, after packing away certain household goods in the shape of pictures, china, and books, we had sold most of our furniture, so that we still had to remain some weeks on board the yacht until our new home, which we christened Salcombe Cottage, was ready. Tupman was paid off and returned to his wife at Exmouth, Baron remaining on board as crew, cook, and general servant. A more picturesque anchorage than this off the old red brick village of Itchen Ferry thirty years ago would not be easy to find. And we lay here for some time, with good landing hards for supplies, etc., close at hand on either side the river. We were close to the moorings of a small fleet of half-deck trawlers and shrimpers, which every Saturday, as they lay legged up on the hard for a scrub, formed a busy, picturesque foreground of men, boats, and nets. And I only recollect one occasion in which even our Commodore had an anxious moment in this berth, and this was when during a short absence ashore of Baron and myself, she, Buzz, and her little girl being in sole charge, a lad on board a small yacht astern hailed her with, Do you know, marm, you're a dragon of your anchor? And the dog, Buzz, barking furiously at the boy, she hailed him back, like a real Commodore, with, Well, if I am, I can't help it. We found, however, on our return, that it was a false alarm, the RVW having only swung with the tide a trifle nearer the smaller yacht's bowsprit than usual. Having no further present use for the yacht, and knowing that she would be too large for single-handed day cruising, she was now advertised for sale. 
and shortly afterwards, in a weak moment, I was persuaded by a local auctioneer to try and sell her by public auction to be held on board, and in order to facilitate this, we left our moorings in the itchin for the inner dock at Southampton. This inner or floating dock was a far quieter and cleaner place than today and our only neighbors in the corner we selected were Lady Franklin's celebrated Arctic search vessel, the Fox, and Lord Dufferin's little eighty-ton schooner, Foam. On board the Fox, a man was in charge who had served in her under Sir Leopold McClintock, and we had many a yarn with him about that memorable expedition. She was a sturdy-looking small screw steamer with bows and sides of great thickness above and below her water, or rather ice line. Strangers and visitors going round the docks under the guidance of an old dock loafer always came to stare at this vessel, and with the object, no doubt, of keeping his audience longer in hand, this mendacious or inventive man contrived to include the Rip Van Winkle in his program, and Baron heard him one day explaining to his party how this small vessel had recently crossed the Atlantic with a Dutch family on board who were now living in her, Baron adding, that he carefully helped the man by answering questions addressed to him in an unintelligible lingo invented for the occasion. Sunday was the great show day for the lions of the docks, and on one of these we were amused. While at dinner in our cabin we heard Baron, as he handed down a bowl of hot potatoes to us through the skylight, answer some sightseers who had been watching him fry some chops on deck in this unknown tongue or as he called it double dutch which mystifies anyone what wants to know all about us next to baron the dog buzz was our best cork fender against inquisitive visitors he was not a dog to entertain strangers, and all attempts to board his ship were resisted by him in a most determined way, while, unless accompanied by one of her crew, nothing would induce him to abandon his post on board. I often wondered he was not lost overboard during our cruise, when keeping his anchor watch in a tideway up and down the narrow deck round the cockpit, and shall not soon forget an alarm he gave me late one night in the docks, when I was awoke out of a sound sleep by a heavy splash in the water between the yacht and the quay. Sound, close to an inch plank, is greatly magnified, especially when one is half awake. Baron was not on board when I turned in, and I rushed on deck just as I was expecting to find him in the dock. He was not at any rate on board, nor was Buzz in his locker or on deck, and everything round the yacht was as still as the grave. So feeling sure that either man or dog, or perhaps both, must be in the water, I shoved the dinghy overboard to have a look round in her. The jetty we lay at was built on piles, and after paddling once or twice round the yacht, I at last caught sight, in a gleam of lamplight, of a small dark thing under the jetty which I made out to be the dog half out of the water hanging on to a cross stay by his forepaws. He was so frightened that no coaxing would induce him to move, and I had great difficulty in getting the boat near enough to lift him into her. 
after which I turned in again almost as damp as the dog, and shortly afterwards heard Baron, who had been spending the evening with some friends, step on board. Poor Buzz was not a true sea-dog, being born to be drowned, which came to pass some years after this, when, in chase of a cat, he slipped off a wall in the night into a water-butt. Policemen or watchmen were supposed to patrol the docks at night, but the only trouble we ever had from them during the three weeks we lay here was an objection on their part to Baron filling our water cask at a tap near where we lay. He had done this many times, and when interfered with came to me to know what to do, and I told him I would see the dock people about it. On my return, however, I found him, like Mother Hubbard's dog, with a four-gallon breaker full which he said he had got on trial, or for me to taste, from a young man who sold fresh water from a boat in the docks at eighteen pence a ton. I don't know how he kept up his supply after that, unless it came from the original tap when the policeman, as he often is, was somewhere else. The appointed day for the sale came at last, and with it a solemn, inquisitorial-looking band of hard-featured mariners, all strangers to me, but evidently not to the auctioneer. My wife, youngsters, and Baron spent that morning ashore, getting things shipshape in our new home so that I might have nothing to distract me from the business of the day. And I had ample time to note how this party of old marine store and yacht dealers seemed full of important secrets, gathering in little groups of two and three about the cabins, always speaking in those low, mysterious tones adopted by the assembled company and friends of a dear departed relative at his funeral. Until at last I almost felt, as I moved among them, like the guilty ghost of myself, and went on deck to avoid hearing something painful. I am not over-sensitive, however, and have since observed that this preliminary hum of cautious whispering is not confined to the sale of property afloat. It was at this stage of the proceedings that my auctioneer drew me aside, and after inquiring what was the very lowest figure I was disposed to let her go for, and on hearing it, confided to me that everything now depended upon him and his eloquence, in combination with the effect upon the brain of the assembled company of a mixture of cold grog to be placed at once upon the cabin table. I therefore inquired delicately the exact proportions he thought would prove most efficacious. He said at once, one or two, or, as he explained it, a bottle of brandy to two of water. Looking at the hard-headed group assembled about that cabin table, it seemed to me doubtful whether a mixture of even two to one would have much effect on their brains. The grog was soon prepared, and almost as soon vanished, and silence having been called by the man of business for an eloquent address, a long pause ensued before a mysterious bid or two came from some invisible party after which this convivial meeting broke up. I don't know or care what became of that auctioneer. 
This was more than thirty years ago, and he has had time to drink himself to death but i know that he left me then a wiser and poorer man by five pounds with the r v w still on my hands in the southampton docks besides the waste of money and brandy this was a feeble and ignominious end for a three months cruise in a remarkable craft like the rip van winkle even up to our last day at sea in her, a more artistic or exciting end might have been managed, beginning, for instance, in a calm outside the needles, and a sun sinking beyond a long, low belt of jagged cloud forms with a pale, sickly light above, across which flit the spectral shapes of the torn, ragged locks of a typhoon and after telling tupman that i don't like the look of yonder sky i leave him at the tiller and go below to consult the aneroid then he turns to my wife with nor do i marm though i've seen the likes of it in the tropics and she who has been admiring the sunset says do you really think, then, Mr. Tupman, we are likely to have a storm? To which he replies, Sailors, marm, are born for all weathers. Still, with all my heart, I would for the dear children's and your sake we were inside the white. But Providence, having seen fit to leave us out here with the tide against us, we must have faith, and never forget the old song which tells us, Mrs. L., there's a sweet little cherub as sits up aloft, etc. And even now, as I come on deck again and relieve Tupman at the helm, a hysterical shudder trembles among our slackened cordage and sails as they hang yet useless and motionless aloft, heavy with the clammy night dew from our tapering spars. That's a good beginning, and half an hour later, the storm blast is upon us, and the sea becomes a seething, boiling scum of shapeless spoon drift. In fact, it loses its head altogether, cut off by the howling tempest around us. Weather permitting, the RVW was a decent kind of sea boat. But, like my wife and a friend of hers I met at sea, she did not care for this sort of thing. Still, she tried to do her best, and, with every sail, rope, spar, and timber madly groaning, now tore through the dark, yeasty striped surges off black gang chine as though she felt instinctively that each life on board hung upon her power to weather st catherine's light well she didn't and after missing stays as she inevitably would under the circumstances and a feeble attempt to wear off shore a crash follows while Tupman and I are below consulting the chart over a glass of grog, and in five minutes all that remained of the yacht was her dinghy, which steered by Baron safely rides ashore under the scowling cliffs of Black Gang with the Commodore and my three children. The worst of this kind of word-painting is that it uses up so many pots of scarce and expensive adjectives that you almost want a boy in buttons to look them up in the dictionary for you. But putting that aside, I think the above is a better ending, and it would not only have saved a bottle of brandy and other expenses of the auction, but have cut this water biography short, while the mast and large timbers of the RVW 
would have made good foreground bits for artists on that lonesome shore. Even the ark, after Noah and his family left it, must have looked well against an evening sky on top of Ararat. But when a light furniture van, the day after that auction in the docks, drew up on the jetty alongside the yacht, and all our traps, bedding, books, pots, and pans were loaded on it for conveyance to Woolstone, the Rip Van Winkle, as we left her, hardly showed it all above the quay among the large craft about her. It was perhaps as well, after being so long at sea, that we had to remain in dock for a few weeks, because in that time we all quite lost our sea legs, and walked respectively up and down Southampton High Street without that strange roll which often marks the real yachtsman just landed after a long voyage. Baron, who was a ready-made man Friday, accompanied us to our new home on shore, and after scrubbing all our floors as only a sailor could, cooked for us the first real roasted leg of mutton we had tasted since leaving Sidmouth. He remained with us here three weeks, and I wished I could have kept him all together. So handy and useful was he in a house. His man Friday kept his house tidy, for it was his duty to do so. Old Song End of chapter 10